And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Manu Dua. And uh, he's got 45 or 5,400 posts on Dental Town. So I feel like you're uh, my brother that we we uh, live in the same dorm. He graduated from UBC, University of British Columbia in Canada in 2012. Upon graduating, he worked in Northern Alberta to hone his skills, which included hospital privileges. After years of associating, Dr. Dua built a successful startup in a recession in his hometown of Calgary last year. One of the first things Dr. Dua did after graduating was complete a dental mission trip in an orphanage in Peru, which changed his life and set the tone for the rest of his career. His last dental mission trip to the Amazon was one of the most adventurous and amazing journeys of his life. I remember you posting about uh, tarantulas and anacondas. Yeah. And Giving back to the community is an important aspect of Dr. Dua's vision. He has been involved in the CUPS program, volunteering to provide dental care for those less fortunate in downtown Calgary. As an average dentist, Dr. Dua is humbled by the challenges of dentistry and hopes he can provide a valuable service for his patients on a daily basis. Manu, I'm so glad you came on the show today because, um, you know, when you look at who's all registered on using Dental Town on the desktop, it's all baby boomers. And if you look at everybody who's downloaded the app, it's all millennials. And I'm sure the millennials get tired of listening to a bunch of old farts like me all day and would much rather listen to someone five years out of school. Or, now, are you technically a millennial? I think I'm borderline. Well, you got a, 1980 is the beginning. What year were you born? 86. Oh, hell, you're, you're, you're six years into being a millennial. Um, oh. <laughs> so, uh, so, so what, what is up? You, you talk about the illusion of dentistry. Uh, well, first of all, huge fan of your 5,500 posts. I mean, I just, I just love you to death. Um, I feel like I know some of your thoughts. I've been following your journey. You've been a member uh, since 2012. Um, you, you talk a lot about the illusion of dentistry versus reality as a newer grad in terms of growing as a person, both personally and professionally, the scary gap in knowledge between dental curriculum and the real world practice. What was it, you know, I'm, I'm 30 years removed from graduating from dental school. So, you know, I remember when I was in dental school, I could name you every teacher I had from kindergarten to the end of high school. Now, I don't right. think I can remember, you know, at 55, you remember like two teachers. Uh, yeah. So you're, you're just five years removed. What was it like looking back at the journey from leaving dental school to where you are now five years out? I think uh, I'm trying to forget my props, to be honest. You're and trying to I think your what? My, I'm trying to forget my dental frost. <laughs> <laughs> trying You're trying to block them out of your mind? Yeah. So I think, you know, when I started, my sister's a dentist. She's eight years older. So when I, when I started, I was like, okay, we're going to work Monday to Thursday, nine to five. You know, all my buddies are in med. You know, I don't want to do residency. And, but the reality is, you know, when you get out, because there are more dentists and it's being beaten to death, is you have to work harder. And that's kind of what you're talking about the millennials is it's supply and demand. If you have to work Saturdays, you work Saturdays. Like I work Saturdays, I work Sundays. I mean, you do whatever it takes. But what I mean is that's not what I, you know, when I signed up, I thought I'd work Monday to Thursday. I'd get paid and I'd get late. Now I don't get paid. I don't get late and I work Saturdays or Sundays. So <laughs> I think. You thought you'd be I a rich just, baller by now? You thought you'd be a rich baller true. driving a fancy car? The problem with dentistry is not that there's anything wrong with dentistry. It's just that we're. Wherever you go, you don't get support. You go to your friend, they'll be like, where's your Ferrari? You go. Like the reality is you have to grind it out like any other job, but we don't we don't get the acknowledgement for the hard work, but we get all the stigma of you work three days and you make a million dollars because dentists make too much money and so on and so forth. So either way, you kind of get, and the problem is with the younger guys is we're still in the shadows. There's guys who have been practicing 20 years. They're set, you know, you know, they're doing well, but the younger guys, they don't. So... When people talk to you, when you when you deal with even patients, they assume that everybody's like that guy thirty years out who's you know doing well if provided you took care of the finances, but they're doing well and they're established. Where the younger guys, most of the guys I know are working two to three jobs, working Saturdays, working till nine p.m., just doing whatever it takes. But you don't get that acknowledgement either, right? So what I'm saying is it's not that it's a bad thing. It's just it needs to be more acknowledged. So we're real. Nobody's real anymore. It's all fancy stuff. It's all the less you work, you know, most jobs, I mean, anyone successful, they tell you about hard work. In dentistry, where you're going on, people are actually proud of making more money and working less. Like, it's not a bad thing, but you got to acknowledge that there are people 
a lot of my patients are poor. So I understand. Even when we, we immigrated to Canada, my mom worked three jobs, worked at Walmart till eight in the morning. Is you know, there are people working day and night. So, you know, we deal with the public every day. So if you're bragging about working two days, how are you supposed to relate with your patients? And why do you think they'd feel ever feel sorry for you for working two days and taking seven figures or whatever it is, right? So I think there's a disconnect because we are healthcare. You know, there are different aspects of dentistry, just like medicine, but I'm in healthcare. You know, a lot of my patients are paying, a lot of them are poor. I can't sit there and pretend I'm not. So you got to relate to your patients. And the problem there's, yeah, I think there's just a disconnect between what dentistry is, what students think it is, and what it actually is. And there's even a disconnect between the way you've practiced and the way what the environment I'm coming into, right? So. so satisfaction equals a perception of what's happening minus what you expected. So you're right. saying that when you were in high school, you expected dentistry to, um, what, how did you, what was that rhyme you said? Uh, getting, getting paid and getting laid. You, you thought you'd work a lot less hours, make a lot less, make a lot more money and get laid a lot more. And that, and the perception that didn't work out that way. No. I can even afford expensive internet, man. <laughs> yeah. But, you yeah, know, it's, it's, and it's, the problem is obviously the debt, the more debt you pay, the more, you know, it's just, you're getting the same degree. Like the degree hasn't changed between when you graduate. It's just the cost of the degree. Your initials are MD. Do you think you should have became an MD instead of a DDS? <laughs> I, I thought it'd be obnoxious if it'd be MD, MD, right? MD squared. I thought about it. <laughs> MD squared? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So are I you mean, a DDS I'm, or a DMD? I'm DMD, close enough. You're you're a DMD, so your initials MD, and your degree is DMD. Yeah, that you should yeah. that should be your brand, MD DMD. That is so damn funny. Or or what did you <laughs> say? Or DMD squared? Yeah, DMD squared. Well, do yeah. do you think looking back? I mean, look at your your classmates uh, from high school and grammar school and college. Do you think it would have been a better move? to go into medicine or law or programming or did any of those guys come out easier and ahead and making more money in less hours than your DMV? I don't think it's easy, right? If anything, it's harder in those things. What I mean is opportunity costs. Because with medicine and dentistry, you get some of the best years of your life, right? Your mid-20s and that. So there's a lot of potential. And the problem is you don't even know what real dentistry is till about two years out. So you're kind of, you know, in the first two years, especially DMD, we're sitting in the classrooms doing PBL, just useless things that there's nothing to do with dealing with patients, dealing with dentistry, right? So I was even told that I'm too type B of a person. I should become type A. I mean, a lot of people are kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of like a moth in a light. It's like dentistry, you know, there'll be money, da, 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 da. But I mean, no one's telling the reality. So I think you go on student doctor and that people are still in this perception because nobody tells the truth right and and the problem is is it's a good job no, but it's a dirty job and there's a lot of psychological components nobody talks about you know dealing every person that comes in pretty much hates you right off the bat they don't know you right so my favorite person is you know they come in and the patients like I hate I hate the dentist so I'm like I hate you too and they're like whoa and I'm like well now you know what it feels like right but the point is nobody tells the truth, so you don't even know what you're getting into. Now you're going to spend half a million dollars on your education or 300 or whatever it is. You should probably know exactly what you're getting into. You buy a house, you know what you're getting. So that's where I'm coming from is that some of those kids could have done something better. They could have you, been you've said a couple of times everybody lies to you. You mean on Student Doctor Network or who's all lying to you? I'm not saying they're lying. I'm just saying like people kind of glamorize it because nobody actually tells you how it is, right? You know. They'll tell you about their technology and all the cool toys, but the reality is they're buying all those toys because they're bored. They're bored or they've kind of lost interest in what it is. And they don't want to uh, settle for piss, which is yeah. a patient interaction skill set. I mean, you know, I, I'd rather you have great piss than a laser or a CAD cam or a CBCT. I mean, the, the, the thing I tell kids when they come out of school, the person who's going to crush it, is the, the warm, caring person who can connect with people, not the idiot with a laser and a CAD cam and a CBCT and the, all that alphabet soup bullshit behind your name. Almost every patient that hands me a card, they'll be a realtor or something, and they'll have all these initials behind their name. Nobody knows what any of that stuff is. You just know if you like the guy. I, I'm going to steal your line when you said, uh, I said, would you do it again? And you said, well, 
my, my, my patients are glad I did it. So now when someone asks me, are you yeah. glad you had children? I'm going to say, you know, my children are glad I had children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just <laughs> kidding. Yeah. That's just <laughs> but as a, it, it is it is children are the hardest job you'll ever have uh but it's uh yeah. it's it's a great especially if you have four incredibly crazy boys i'm sure my life would have been so much yeah. easier if i just had four innocent little daughters uh but my dentist friend <laughs> <laughs> with daughters says no that's a delusion too um so Coming out of dental school, I mean, you know, you're just five years removed from graduating from dental school. I'm 30 years removed. Looking back right. closer, just five years out, did dental school prepare you for the real world? <laughs> they took my money. That's what they did. But uh, did they prepare me? No, not really. Um, if anything, they motivated me. Because, you know, a lot of schools, right, most people don't have a good, you know, experience from their dental schools. It's not getting any better. Um, I think the reality is the, the ones that did shape my life were the instructors that taught part-time. They right. practiced in the real world, so they could tell me what's what. The guys that were there full-time and got paid the most, ironically, did the least. And that's where there's a huge disconnect. You know, your, your dean probably didn't even practice a year in practice. He would know nothing about staff issues dealing with... Did you know when I, was in, with, when I was in dental school in 87, half the deans in America weren't even dentists? It's been a new trend right. that maybe the dean should be a damn dentist. That's a, um, because back in the day, they thought they should be a doctor, a PhD in education. And uh, right. it's just crazy. But you're right. I mean, the part-timers were in real world. So you, you agree that the part-timers getting paid the least taught you the most. Yeah, I mean, like, I get a, I get a letter asking for a donation, and I almost want to write them back asking for my money back. I wonder what their refund policy is because you I don't know. You should have then posted on Dental Town. <laughs> <laughs> See I what their like reply is. My money Ironically, the people that taught me the most didn't get a dollar from me. You know, it's people that just generally love the profession, love what they do. And, you know, even on downtown, there's so many people that give a lot of good advice. A lot of salesmen, but, I mean, the ones that actually helped, even my startup, they didn't get a dollar from me. It's just because they generally loved it. And then that's where there's a disconnect because education isn't there to teach. Education is the business. You know, that's where there's a bit of a, an issue, right, where when you're paying half a million dollars, that's an investment for your startup. You know, you can build a business for that. So if you're going to do that, you should know exactly. You don't, you don't just build a clinic and say, hey, you know, here's half a million, build a clinic. No, you're going to look at every detail, every cost, every so on, right? Why is it in education? I pay half a million. I don't have a clue. No one's accountable. What's real? What's not? You know, what's relevant? What am I going to come out with? What's tangible? So, and it's not only did you pay half business. a million, you lost eight years of your life when you could have had a job earning money and learning a trade. And everybody agrees that it takes about 10,000 hours, which is about 10 years to master something. So by the time you go to four years of dental school, right. uh, four years undergrad and four years of dental school, you could have already mastered, you could have almost mastered something else, been earning money and mastering something. I mean, I got a lot of classmates that by the time I got out of dental school, they're already millionaires from uh, their, 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 their own thing. You know what I mean? And that's the thing is that because you've invested so much time, it's like, and money, it's hard for you to do something else. Maybe your true calling was something else, you know, like, you know, Maybe, you know, you could have done something, something a little bit more relevant, right? So that's, that's the thing is you've invested so much, it's hard to switch. Like if you'd only spent 20 grand for your dental school, something better came along, you could have switched it and you've done your true talent. So there's a lot of miserable professionals out there. And, you know, it's hard for them to love teeth because they're so vested in now they've got family and responsibility. It's like a vicious cycle. And, and then part of that is just no one's real on what the reality is. And, and man, like, like you said, there's so, many, there's so many different ways with social media and online apps. And like just the job, the jobs out there have expanded and they're so creative, right? You know, that you didn't have. And before it was traditional, like you go, you get a doctor, guaranteed you're going to get paid in late, right? Now it's like you get out and you're grinding it out just like the plumber, just like you got to advertise, like, you know, like everybody else, it's like your profession doesn't really buy you that competitive advantage. It would have. So, so that's that's the issue. 
So when you got out of school, walk us through your journey when you got out of school. Um, how long were you an associate how, um, before you opened up your private practice? And, and, and opine on your classmates too. I mean, how long did the average associate last? I mean, did you asso how many years did you associate before you opened up your own practice? And of your graduating class, was that about the same experience or a lot of them still associates or? I don't really talk to my classmates, but I think there's a few that have started up, but most are associates. Um, I, I did about four years, three and a half, four years. So, um, you're, so kind of your practice has only been open one year? It's been one year, yeah, this year. So the four years of associates, was that four years at one place? Uh, no. Well, here's it every place. So I, I moved around. I went up north, um, worked in a small town. I just wanted to get my own main goal was to start my practice. So I wanted to work different places, different high end, low end. But that, you know, that, that, and is, then I just, that is something I want to key in on, though, because when when corporates out there telling everybody that, you know, they've gone from zero to 12 percent of the market in the last, you know, uh, 15 years and the next 10 years are going to go from 12 to 24 percent. You know, they think in a decade they'll have a quarter of the market. I look at that and I say, well, when I look at private practice and I look at corporate, uh, associates aren't staying anywhere. It seems like the only people that stay in their own place are the ones that bought in and own. It seems like the only place you can find a dentist that stayed someplace for 10, 20, 30, 40 years was an owner. The associate, do you agree that the associate turnover no matter what setting, they're just fly by night. Well, I, and I can tell you why being on the short end of everything is that when you get out, you're supposed to have a doctor. We're supposed to be colleagues, right? When you work for someone, that's not how it is. When they look at a new grad, they're either looking at cheap labor, you know, that's their first thing. How can I use them to my benefit? Or two, they're treated as employees, Right, they, they show more respect to their own staff than to the guy who has the degree. So it's not a collegial thing. I'm not saying it's true everywhere, but it's more like you're treated like an employee. You know, this is our equipment. This is all you get. Do it that way, and that's why if you don't have a buy-in, no associate's gonna stay because you you don't practice the way reality sets in. You know, this is not the way you wanted to do work. This is not the way you want to treat people. This is the way the office manager tells you to treat people. This is the way. That you're not doing it your way, and dentistry is so individualistic. I think that's that's part of it. Yeah. So, so how's your uh, how? So, did you do a de novo or did you buy a practice? I just started scratch. So you did a start from scratch de novo, uh, and you're one year into it. So talk about that part of the journey. Are you sleeping with one eye yeah. open with uh, atrial fibrillation, or are you? Are you scared or are you doing good? Where, where are you at? Well, I don't know the definition of success, but nobody's died in a year. So <laughs> I'd say we're on a good side. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, keep your expectations <laughs> low. Um, but yeah, the recession was huge. And, and part of it is like, I was real, you know, and that's the issue I have is that, you know, like a lot of dentistry is like, do the fancy things, do the implant, there's the line, but most of dentistry is like real world, like, you know, we call it janitorial dentistry because you're in there. So I focused on just basic things like root canals, extractions, in there. And I mean, we're like 500 something patients. We broke even like five months in, so can't complain. But a lot of I just kept my expectations real and just took care of the patients and the rest. Everybody's success is different, right? And then the numbers never end. I love this quote from Bob Marley. He says, you know, I, I might paraphrase is wrong, but he's like, if you chase money, you'll never be happy because money is numbers and numbers never end. And that's it. Nice. I love Bob. So Marley. a lot of people that Bob they Marley, be making millions. Bob Marley trivia. Do you yeah. know how he died? What he died of? How he died? No, he let me. He died from skin cancer. You know why? Yeah, because right. he's Jamaican, you know, you, you think he's very dark complected, but not on the bottom of his feet. So when you're laying on yeah. your stomach on the beach, the bottom, the, the underside of his little toe, his little toe got skin cancer in the part that's not pigmented. And they told me I had to cut it off and he wouldn't because he was a Rastafarian and he, it was against the religious belief. So it metastasized his brain and killed him. But I loved his lyrics. And another thing interesting about his lyrics is, 
Um, whenever you lecture anywhere in the Caribbean, but also all of Africa, Tanzania, Somalia, South Africa, yeah. Soweto, I mean, Bob Marley is, he just rules uh, Africa and the Caribbean because he's got so many meaningful lyrics like that. Uh, I, I, I love sure. that, that song. What song was that in? Oh, no, it's just a quote he said, you know. Oh, I'm just talking about money. Her. Yeah. But I mean, that's it, right? Like, what everybody's idea of success is relative. It's all yeah. context. But if you have good content, you know, you'll always do well. So, did you do demographics? Were you trying to go into the, uh, you're in Calgary. Were you trying to go into the yeah. rich uh, area of Calgary, the middle class, the poor downtown? Oh, hell no, I can't. I, I, I worked high end and I couldn't do it. It's just not me. Um, so, I knew I was going to work blue collar, that's me. Um, um, you know, blue collar, middle class, you know, good, good working people. Those are the best. They're not, it's not the most glamorous work. You know, it's, it's, uh, but it is rewarding for sure. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of knew I worked. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I agree. I, my, one of my classmates, he was all handsome and hot and he liked all the, the cosmetic and the high on. And I, I did his location for him in North Scottsdale and he crushed it. But I, I was a Kansas boy. Uh, it just that wasn't yeah. me at all. It's like I wasn't gonna go up there and hooty tooty cosmetic stuff with all these uh, people like that. I, I, I'm across the street from the Guadalupe Indian Reservation. Those are my favorite patients. And then my practice is actually yeah. in Phoenix, and those are my next to the normal patients. But yeah, so you, so you figure you're being true to yourself that you were a blue, blue collar boy, and so you wanted I, to have. I a, was your Ghetto dentistry, we call it, but that's me. You know, clearance. I've never heard of that ghetto trash. dentistry. Yeah. Yeah, and janitorial dentistry. You know, that's <laughs> that's dentistry. real world. You know. And janitorial, and what would uh, what would Gigi Hodd's practice be? I know she's your mentor. Oh, she's straight hood, like <laughs> you know, <laughs> she knows. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so Gigi, Gigi, Gigi <laughs> is a uh, hood dentistry. Is that what you hood say? Dentistry. Yeah, and you know we need to celebrate that more because that's the fun dentistry. That's the rewarding. That's the healthcare dentistry. Well, you Patients know, let me, get, let me give you I, but, a dilemma I have. So on the online CE, you know, we make that free in the third world, and all the cosmetic, yeah. you know, all these cosmetic courses are on, um, you know, veneers and lasers, and but for all of Africa and all of Asia and all of Latin America, cosmetic dentistry is some girl's crying because she lost number a front tooth and some dentist there wants right. to learn how to make a flipper to replace her front tooth and when you do you rock yeah. her world i have spent since 2004 to 2017 trying to get one damn cosmetic dentist to make me a course to make a flipper for a front tooth so to, to because when i'm in africa and asia and cambodia and indonesia and Th and Thailand, they're, that's what they're saying. They say we're not gonna we I, we don't want any CBCT courses. We don't want any CAD CAM chair side. None, none of that shit's ever gonna happen for one and a half million out of two million dentists. We want courses, more yeah. courses. Cosmetic dentistry is a is a rock and hot denture, but more importantly, it's a flipper. Sometimes it's a partial. I can't get any Americans because their their ego is too big to settle down to the common man. Forget. Forget memories. I'll tell you, Calgary is one of the highest LVI dentists in, in probably North America, right? And I go to study clubs. Even 10 minutes away, their demographics are so different. So I go to study clubs. And I'm watching these bougie, you know, I can't say the word here. But, like, you know, they're up on their own. What's the word? Bougie? <laughs> like bougie motherfuckers, but, but I can't. <laughs> you can say <laughs> they're it's so industry uncensored. Yeah, right. So it's like bougie motherfuckers, and they're sitting there, and it's like, oh, when we come, we take 32. I'm like, the fucker's in pain. You know, most of my new patients are in extraction or root canal. That's how we meet. So you're sitting there looking at the Kuzo plane, and it's like, for fuck's sake. You know what I mean? It's like, seriously, bro. And that's what I mean. Like, most people are day to day. I have patients paying like $20 a day saving up so I can pull one tooth. When I started up, I had a girl call us. I had no patients. And she's like, I've called five clinics. I'm in a lot of pain. I have ninety dollars. Will you do it? I said, Yeah, fuck yeah, let's go. Cause I do, I'll do extractions all day. For me, it's no big deal, right? I came and took care, and we we're like, we'll never see the money again. She came back and paid and brought her kids, and there. So, 
that's real world, right? And that's helping people. The cosmetic shit, everybody likes it. You know? But I'm like, I'd invite Koi's or Spears, come live a day doing ghetto dentistry. Those guys wouldn't last a minute. You know, because that's real world. I have buddies that are ear docs. They have my number. They'll text me. They were like, I have one of your patients here. What should I give them? Because it's either ER or or my clinic. So that's real world. Because they're they're like one night away from But what you just said, you know, Coist and Sphere, whatever, you know, not only did the dental schools take you for half a million dollars, but when you get out, the dental industry sees a dental student with a big target on his back and says, oh, my God, we got a, we got another young dumb one. Let's go get him a $150,000 chair site milling, a $100,000 CBCT, an $80,000 laser. They, they, they try to double your student loan debt in an hour. Do you agree with that assessment or disagree? 1,000% because, you know, like you say, you want to build a practice. You learn how to do extractions and root canals. You'll build a practice, Right. You want to ruin your practice? You get a whole bunch of cosmetic people that will never be happy. Because you got to be happy with yourself, right? If that smile bothers you that much, you've got a whole lot of other problems other than your teeth, right? You can't treat someone's mental condition. Yeah, it might do it superficially, but you learn the basics. Nobody learns the basics. Everyone wants to do a C-Rack, right? They should call it C-Rec because nothing ruins enamel like young doctors on a, on a C-Rec, right? And what's Serona stock? It's like double, tripled in the last few years. So the business of dentistry is more than the actual dentistry. And you're right, nobody's learning. Everybody wants to go to Coise and Spears. It's like, why don't you learn how to do a class filling? You know, why don't you learn how to do those WTF amalgams or whatever in the back, second molar on a fat lady? You know, so let's try that. That's real dentistry, but nobody wants to do it because they'd rather get a comb beam, get an implant, and do that. But you got to start from somewhere. And, and what percent of the dentists on the circuit make all their money uh, selling stuff to, to you? Yeah, I don't know the percent. I don't listen to anybody other than, but I'm, I'm sure there's a lot. And that's the thing is, you're right, you ask them what they do in their daily life because you have to practice what you preach. You'll, you'll find it ironic. You know, did you know that Steve Jobs didn't even let his kids touch technology? They limited their technology time. So, you know, well, in your own, you got to see what. Kid, right? Yeah, but but if you, I think there, I was watching the CEO on a TED, there was a TED talk, talking about all a lot of the guys in Silicon Valley. They actually limit the, the time that their children spend on technology because they realize how America was pushing back on uh, the Syrian refugees when it's a country built on refugees, and Steve Jobs is Sy- a Syrian. His father's a Syrian refugee. Syrian. It's like, really? I mean, yeah. it's like America is so, <laughs> the insanity of politics is crazy. But uh, so are, no, you know, no. so what are, you, what are your hours like? How many hours are you putting in a week? Um, we're here five, you know, I, but when you run a business, like, you know, like you don't technically have hours. You're always on, right? So the hours that our clinic is open is by five, five to six days, you know. But it's whatever we can fill up because we're startups, so we do the best we can. But your mind is running seven days a week, right? So, so that, that's the question I want to ask because exactly owning your own business is a lifestyle, and if you and uh, yeah. and when you work for corporate dentistry, that that's what they advertise the most that that you that dentistry doesn't have to be your life. You just come in and uh, do your time from Monday through Friday to five and have your own life. And um, we're always told I'm a baby boomer. That the millennials are so different, and I, I don't really know. I mean, I only I only really know four millennials. That's my children. Um, but do you? Yeah. What percent of the millennials do you think want the lifestyle to be an owner operator if they could, if it all worked out? Versus what percent of millennials you say, no way, I'm not going to work like my dad. That was crazy. I'm not going to have five kids like my mom. I'm I just want the eight to five, I don't want the lifestyle of an ownership. I mean, it's hard to get percentages because, you know, it's all anecdotal, but I think everybody picks on millennials, but you understand the millennials are coming at a hard time, right? They expected, oh, everyone was supposed to retire, but it's our parents and our grandparents. It's like the reason they screwed up their finances and most of them are working till 70, they won't give it up. So when you're a new grad, like you said, coming out in half a million debt and the old guys are just not giving it up. So, like, what do you expect them to do, right? It's a bit of both. I can't, I mean, it's hard to generalize just one. But they're not coming into a lucrative environment. 
they got corporate, you know, cannibalizing clinics. They got old guys that should give up their clinic. I mean, half of them at 70, 80, you can barely see. You know, how are you going to find MB2? Well, you know, <laughs> right? you know so what the answer get- is that because I've, I've, uh, I've actually spent the day in a 92-year-old dentist's office. His name was George Rui in St. George, Missouri. I've done it several times. The deal is when you're 92, um, all your patients are 80, 90, or 100. So it's right. mostly a social yeah. visit. I mean, and, and this George Rui, you know, his, his wife had passed earlier. And hell, you're the, when you're 92, you're the hottest man in, in the city to every woman who's over 85 years old. I mean, could you imagine being an 85-year-old widow and you could go to a 92-year-old dentist and then he, he would have one patient in the morning, then he'd take her to lunch. Then he'd have another hot day yeah. in the afternoon, then he'd take her to dinner. And he was just living the high life, man. He was deep. He had two dates a day. So he probably didn't even think about the MB2. <laughs> that's the lifestyle I was promised. What's that? Right? That's, I mean, that's the lifestyle I was promised. Right? <laughs> My God, he I was a baller. He was, he was a St. Joe baller, man. And, uh, but, yeah, but you're right. If, when he did a DO, I mean, I, he, he put three spills of amalgam in the pulp. <laughs> But when you're eight, so, when you're 85, uh, you probably have a hell of a lot less pain tolerance because it, 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 it just worked somehow. You know what I mean? Cra- crazy, yeah. crazy. So times. I mean, like that's the thing. The millennials don't have the opportunities like as easily granted because they're coming in where debt is higher and, and job opportunities are less. So you can't. It's hard to blame them. Okay, let, 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 let me. But I, I think. Me, yeah. And yeah. by the way, when I when you're listening to me and I'm throwing. Uh, Molotov cocktails at millennials. You remember, it comes from love. If I if I was trying to sell you something, I'd be telling you fluffy stuff. The fact that I'll tell you what I actually yeah. think is a sign of love and respect. But one one of my beefs about millennials is, you know, so many of those millennial uh, dental students graduated. Their parents immigrated from another continent, another hemisphere. Uh, you know, thousands of miles. And then when they get out of school, I say, well, can you just not go in downtown Phoenix and go? 40 miles out into the rural where they, well, you'll just crush it. And they're like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. not, I'm not going to go to Maricopa. That, that's 30 minutes away. I'm like, dude, your mom came from Vietnam and you can't go, you can't go to Eloy, Arizona. <laughs> you know what I mean? So what, yeah. what is, what is, what is that all about? I think it's not the actual going there, but <sighs> yeah, I mean, it's 50, 50, I think. Their, their parents also didn't spend eight years in school, right? Like you said, they've already done a fair amount of sacrifice when they get out. Now they got a debt. Do you know what I mean? It's just one after the other. There's no light in sight. And it's not for everybody, right? The whole point, the reason why they're, they're upset is the whole point of doing dentistry is you could enjoy your life to live where you kind of wanted to live and do it in there. If I had to go live in a buttfuck rural town, I would have done engineering or done something else, right? Because it would kill my life. They're it's not for everybody. What? They're killing your what? Well, like if, if you're if you're born in a city, right? All your friends are here and that you would you'd have to give up a lot to do what to just do a couple fillings here in the middle of like that's not that's not for everyone is what I'm saying. Um, but you know so what's you know what's going to be the game changer on that though. So think about is, when you're at home um, that every day maybe you might spend an hour uh, watching the news or watching a movie or on your computer or something like that with driverless cars you could have a rural practice live in the urban and crawl out of bed and your driverless car might just be a box with just a bed and and say say your practice was an hour and a half you might you might supposed to get up at seven you just might get up at 5 30 go crawl into your your bed and hit go and the driverless car takes care i think driverless cars is what's going to push so many people um, out even farther from these big cities because these big cities are too expensive. And also think about this. Yeah. Think about if you were uh, worked in a, a typical cubicle, an engineer, and you're at home and the spouse and the kids are, are, you know, you can't get work done. And then when you're at work, everybody's come by your cubicle talking to you. You can't get shit done, but you got to be there for the meetings, whatever. You could, even if you live two hours away from work, you could get in your driverless car, get on your desk, do all your work, all your email, all your spreadsheets, whatever it is you do, um, then get to work, do your meetings, all that kind of stuff, and then go back to your driver's car, two hours work, and then you could get home and completely unhook 
and disengage from work and engage with your children. I, I think I think driverless cars is going to be one of the biggest social engineering. And and why would you have this uh, gazillion dollar office space in Manhattan and San Francisco uh, when you could you you could push that two hours out of town? Uh, I, I think the biggest lesson yeah. in retail was when Sears spent one billion dollars on their high overhead Sears tower. Uh, while Walmart started uh, with Bentonville, Arkansas, where the owner had a door over two saw posts. And ever since Walmart built that billion-dollar building, they never made a billion dollars a year in profit from that day forward because they were just too high overhead. And um, yeah. if Sam Walton killed anything, he said, I'm not in downtown Chicago with a, in a billion-dollar overhead building. I'm in Bentonville, Arkansas with no overhead. And who won that game in the long run? That's true. I, like I said, I've done rural, right? And then there's pros and cons. You can do it for a little while, but I've, I worked in minus 52 Celsius, so that's like less than minus 40 Fahrenheit. You know, I was alone. I, well, I went there to pay debt, you know, and I did whatever it took. I paid on my debt, like a year and a bit. I paid up all my student loans. I've done it. I'm just saying it sucks. So you, know, you, it's not must, something you must have made a years. lot of money out there then. Yeah, okay. I mean, there's pros. So you made the a lot social. Of money in the, yeah, and but the social aspect. Months. I pay on my loans, but it comes at an opportunity cost, and it comes to sacrifice. So I sacrifice. Your social you know, life. like the going out. And, yeah, so something everything has a cost to it, right? Did so you try dating moose is, or caribou? <laughs> 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 no, they're little. Uh, they're picky. Those ones. <laughs> those moose and caribou are picky. Uh huh. Yeah. So so you're yeah, and you know what? In reality, you know who usually goes rural, the ones with the most debt, and they already got the woman family out of the way. They're usually LDS Mormons, already married, already got kids, yeah. and they don't care if they're in the middle of nowhere because when they got out of work, they just want to go home and play with their kids. And uh, so so they already have, so you're right. It would be the hardest for a single. And the thing is, you're already struggling. Like you're a student for. X amount of years could be eight years. It's getting longer because it's getting harder to get in. Nine years, right? So you're living on a budget for that long. You can't get your degree, and now you've got debt to pay. And so now that eight years becomes 10, 11 years of being frugal. And then now you're watching like 19 year old kids making millions on apps, and you're sitting there, you're like, I, you know, I'm a valued, so called valued healthcare provider, did all this education, and I get treated like shit. You know, patients don't trust us. But did I spend 12 years of my life? I can't even live where I want to live. And so I, I, I can understand why people aren't jumping on board. Like, they'd rather suffer um, for the social aspect because there's more to it than, than just billing, right? So you're one year into a startup. What were your lessons learned? What are you looking at one year out and saying, man, I got an A on that, and other areas saying, man, I wish I would not have done that? Part of working in the hood is, my first lesson was I should have put bars from day one. Gigi actually told me this. Should have done And I kind of laughed about it. Put bars on my windows oh, and doors because I got broken. I got broken at one month in and they stole, they stole my iPads. The only thing that pissed me off was they stole my PlayStation. That is the only thing that annoyed me. I, had to, I put a PlayStation in my office because we were going to have time. Does to Gigi up, have bars but, on her windows? Actually, like double lux. She's ready for a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Woman. But yeah, we got broken. We had patients like lined up the next. It was Friday night. I had patients on Saturday. So the hardest part of me, and I got bills to pay, trying to do extraction there in my mind. There's cops in the thing. Like that was probably that wasn't a fun day for me. And the other thing, when you um, get robbed, for me, it was the uh, the emotion. You feel like you've been violated. You feel like you've been raped. Yeah. You know what I mean? You've been taken advantage yeah. of, and then you're mad that you were a victim, that you didn't have cameras, or you just wanted to, you, at that point, you would yeah. give your car away just to catch the bastard with your own hands, you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they found my safe blown up like 20 kilometers away on the side of a the road, they found they matched the serial number. Someone took my safe from my office and blew it up. And uh, yeah, no, the emotional part is the worst for sure. And like, my staff were like, oh my God, they stole the iPads and cash, and I'm like, I don't care. All I cared was my PlayStation, but that's just me. But I agree, it's the the personal, that personal, uh, that hurts. 
So, so you got broken into. You weren't expecting that. Uh, what else were you not? Uh, um, and then you you well, like, and you open it up um, during a recession. Like, did you see that coming? I mean, when you started breaking ground, did you yeah, rent, yeah. did you rent or build a building? Uh, I'm leasing. You're leasing. When you signed the lease, did you know or smell that you know, a recession was on top of you? Yeah, I, I was. That's the thing is, I was in such a bad place working from one guy to the other, and and I had so many carrots staying in front of me. You know, like you can buy in this and that, and that's so many people like pull it away, and I was just pissed off at that point. And then, as no matter what, I knew this area, I knew the people, I was gonna do it recession or no, we do it, and it's just determination. But but yeah, I know like we've we've been flooded. I've had guys install the vacuum didn't do it right. One day my sterilizer went down. So, and Neelay, the guys would come fix it. It's Friday. And I'm like, where's your guy? He's like, oh, he's somewhere else. And I'm like, well, I have patients tomorrow. And they're like, well, too bad. And I was like, great. So to pack up all my instruments, go to my buddy's clinic at six in the morning next day, get him sterilized, come back. When you have a business, you'll do whatever. And it's not a millennial thing. I think what more is you should say is like, there's grinders and there's non-grinders. In your generation, you have people that didn't grind, you know? It's the same. I think it's just grinders versus non-grinders. Do some people do whatever it takes? Some yeah. people find an excuse not anything. But do you think an associate dentist would have taken all the dirty instruments and gone to his buddy's place the next morning and autoclaved him to come back to work to keep the the team on uh, on schedule? No, I, no way. No, no. they've got no incentive. I like, know, and and they're there. Think, and do you think they? Yeah. So so I just I just I'm. You know, Rick Kirshner has been telling me for 30 years he only believes in owner-operated dentistry. And he's always telling yeah. me, um, you know, and, and the only people that seem to tell me how great uh, the associate dental industry is, is their uh, corporate. They, they, they want a thousand dentists, you know, to work for them as an employee. But I, I, I still, I'm having a hard time seeing it. And I don't like to throw my friends... I don't, you know, I really respect Rick Workman of Harlan. I really respect Steve Thorne of Pacific. I'm, I'm, I want to make clear, it's the same problem um, in, in private. I mean, I don't, I mean, with, in, in my 30 years as owning a practice, I mean, um, it's always been an A if an associate stays with you 10 years, um, you know, and I'll yeah. give them a B uh, if a couple of them stayed uh, uh, seven years. A couple of Gigi's friends stayed with me uh, seven years. But the, but the vast majority um, are just there looking for the next best opportunity to come their way. And, and, and where they end up want, wanting to be is own their own business. And I, I can't fault anybody for that. But what I was going to say is you might respect those guys. I don't. And, and the reason why I don't is, like you said, those guys in the Ferraris and they're, you know, like Kushner. He's got a private jet, talks about elitist dentists. Don't you find that a little ironic? It's people making more money off the back of dentists. They're not in there. So when you're sweating with me and trying to pull out that exo, the abscess, your like triple mask, then I respect you. You're sitting in a palace in there and telling me what dentistry is like. I don't think so. Right? Come here, grind it out with me right now, right here. I respect you. You're sitting in a palace. Like, with all due respect, yeah, you built the business. Great. You know, so did Sam Walton. So did all of them. Right? But don't tell me about dentistry. That's, that's where I have an issue. Like, you're still practicing, and I respect that. That's tremendous respect, honestly. Because it's very easy to sit there and talk about an industry, but you're in there in the trenches. So, you know, I respect every word you'd say. But guys in their Gulf Stream, you know, talking about being elitist, buying four-wheel down Ferraris, that's not a real world. He can't relate to me, right? So he doesn't know my struggle. That's, that's kind of where I have an issue. But the reason associates do is because they're treated like labor, you know, it's not slave labor because that debt, you know, when, when somebody comes out, you'll do whatever it takes. 20 years ago, maybe you wouldn't, but you got a half a million. You might have a family in there. You'll do whatever it takes. So I don't know. Like, it's a, it's a very difficult position for people to be in. And it's very easy to take advantage. And that's the issue is I'm not saying private practice don't take advantage, but Quirks is institutionalized. Like, I went to business school, right? It's institutionalized taking, taking advantage of someone's debt load. That's what it is. They're leveraging someone else's misfortune, right? You get an immigrant, they don't have a job in there. You can take advantage of them easily. 
versus somebody who's well connected in that. So that's what kind of where I have an issue, where I think there's a near breed, and I, I like it, like the younger dentists that are building startups, because we're more knowledge, and a lot of our knowledge is from downtown. You know, so we can we can fight individually. If I had known none none of this, if I didn't have downtown, honestly, yeah, I wouldn't know a fraction of what I knew now. So for that, like I'm tremendously because you only know what you know, right? If I don't know how corps are working, what other people are actually doing in other cities and that, I would have no idea. Kushner Workman could give me an offer and I take it because I don't know any different. So if someone's like listening 500. right now and they're a big fan of the show, but they've never gone to Dental Town, they're not a member of Dental Town, um, or they're a dental student, they never heard of it this first time. Well, what, what, tell them what Dental Town is and what it meant to you. How, how has Dental Town played a part in your journey? I think, I think Dental Town is a place where people would actually listen. You know, a, a lot of times, like you said, you know, no practice, no dance practice alone is you wonder if this is you, like, should you feel this way? Maybe you don't like your job. It's not, I don't blame you. Like, because wherever you go to see, it's like, oh, I love dentistry, I love teeth. What if you don't? You know, what if you like your staff? What if you like your patients as people? But what if you don't like this or that? But who's going to hear you? All of a sudden now you've got thousands of dentists and they're like, hey, you know, I agree with you. And, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, you know, maybe maybe I'm not the one. We always think we're the problem, right? Maybe you're not. Maybe it's just the way it is. Or someone's frustrated being an associate and someone else says, hey, I'm an associate too. I have similar issues. I mean, nobody likes to suffer alone, right? So that there's a little camaraderie and you're like, okay, what can we do better? You know, how can we be better? If you don't like your owner, that's why I did when I built my clinic. I'm like, I work for Jerk Off Office Manager. So I said, when we built my clinic, we're not going to have an office manager. I told my staff, you guys talk to each other. You know, you have two minutes in the parking lot. You want to fight it out, fight it out. But talk to each other. You know, you can you can make it work, right? So I took everything I didn't like and then, you know, practice what I preached. But I, I didn't know that because downtown I met so many other people that felt the same way. And that's what I would say downtown is. It's just finding people. And even if they don't feel the same way, you get different opinions, different styles, right? Like I'll never be a maverick or any of that bullshit. But at least there are other people that, you know, that's how they practice. You, you get to see different styles. You can pick a style for you. When you're a young dentist, you don't know what's right. You might be working for one guy and maybe he's doing things that are kind of sketchy or whatever. And you don't know that's the right way because you don't know any other styles to practice. And dental time just kind of exposes you different styles of practice, different startups, different, you know, you don't have to do that. Like I said, the sexy cosmetic stuff, you can do hood dentistry. That's where Ryan McCall, like all credit to two chairs, you know, and... He opened up like his own niche and all of a sudden, you you know, nobody, you don't have to do the full mouth veneers, right? You could make a very good living and do a valuable service doing ghetto work, you know, working in poor areas, helping people get them out of pain, doing extractions, changing their life. Nobody would have made denture section, right? McCall did. Whereas if I went to the CEs, all the CEs are cat can this, you know, try it, you know, this, Sarah, call me, it's like bullshit because... There are many ways to practice. So, yeah, so, I agree. So I agree if, with your. So thing. if you're, if you're in Calgary doing get a good dentistry, janitorial dentistry, and Gigi's doing hood dentistry in the San Fran area, what's Ryan McCall doing? <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe Ryan McCall's? What, what's his practice? Um, no different, you know. I love that. He's I've never just, heard of uh, ghetto dentistry, janitorial dentistry, hood dentistry. But you know, I, I you know, you, you got to be true to yourself because I, I've been across the street from the Guadalupe, Guadalupe Indian Reservation for thirty years. Not one person there ever stiffed me. Not one person ever paid their bill. And um, when you really felt sorry for everything you put them through, you know, three months later it's Easter and they're bringing you corn tamales that they made by hand themselves. Just the most adorable people in the world. And then I'm in this about a mile and a half away from this little rich pocket. And there's people that own three or four restaurants that I did all this work on and they didn't even pay their bill. I mean, you know, back in the day, you know, and it's like, my God, the, where, where, where if someone says, well, what's your major red flag on a patient? Oh, it's that they drive a Benz and, uh, and have, uh, and are giving off this or that they have money. Uh, when they walk in from Guadalupe, uh, they're, they're just straight up. No, and, and, and the reason why, like, and then if I were friends, we all do the same kind of get of dentistry, right? But the thing with that is the reason why we'll never be as hoity-toity as the fancy guys. You get killed every day. 
you do molar and you do surge, you will get humbled, right? That kicks your butt, that kind of dentistry, because it's hard. Difficult, okay, patients are. It's also the most important. Okay, so you, you talked about endo, and you talked about oral surgery. And when I look at the incomes of general dentists, it's like 174. When I look at endodontists, it's like 324. And oral surgeon is like 374. And then I, then I meet half the graduating class, and they say, well, I, I don't like blood and guts. I mean, I want to do cosmetics, veneers, sleep apnea, Invisalign. They want to do all this soft, white, and fluffy stuff. And I'm telling them all the money is in all the bloody stuff. And, and I, I'm not saying you have to learn how to place implants, but you got to learn how to pull teeth, and you got to learn how to do root canals. And by the time you can pull any tooth in the mouth, that's twice as hard as replacing, uh, you know, placing an implant in a first molar is yeah. 10 times easier than removing a third molar. So what would you say to these kids that are in dental school listening to you right now or associates that uh, they just say, you know, I, I just want to do the white fluffy stuff. I don't, I, I'm, they, they call people like us bloody barbarians and they call them uh, pulp loving white and fluffy. No, I would say we're healthcare providers and they work at a spa. I mean, that's the reality, you know, like people don't go into medicine to just do Botox, right? You don't go in dance tree just to do it. You go in dance tree then we're here to take care of teeth. If you can't take care of teeth, be it extraction through now, like why are you here? And I can understand a few, but it's just everyone wants one easy money or what they think is easy money, but it's not. You know, cosmetics, they have their own issues. You know, Invisalign, you don't do it right. You can be in a lot of trouble three years from now. It's just nobody tells you why because all those things are being sold. You know, Invisalign is a multi-billion dollar company. You know, they're sold as dream, right? But the reality is probably the most rewarding, I don't know about you, but it's when you get someone out of pain, that to me is the most rewarding thing. And that's nobody's that glorifying that. There's no course saying, hey, do your job, you know, get someone out of pain. That'll, you know, you won't get frustrated. You don't have to buy those toys to make yourself feel better. Get them out of pain. They'll thank you for life. They'll tell 10 friends. You built your practice. So that's, what, what high-tech stuff did you buy? Or should I say, what high-tech stuff did you pass on? <laughs> uh, you know, I worked on a lot well, of... Like, I, I, know, I know for a fact you splurged on a game station. But besides your game station... I got, <laughs> I got a 34-inch, yeah. I put it... I think uh, my endo machine, you know, I, I did splurge on it. What's your endo machine? It's got machine? a built-in... It's like the Endotech uh, motor, but what it is, is it's got a built-in rotary and apex locator. So as, as you're doing so rotary, it's automatic. Oh, I don't know. It's a German company. But um, it's, it's called Endotech. And endotech. Can you find that for me? Yeah. Okay, so you got yeah, Endotech you it up, where but... it's where you have electronics on their rotating 300 RPM file. So you know, it's got an apex locator built in file. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. And then like, cause it's all in unit. If you want to add like anything in ultrasonic, you just add it onto the cart and it works really good. So that I did spend uh, extractions, you know, I got the Carl Schumacher stuff from Germany and doing surge, I, I splurged. But what I splurged was on things I would use every day where I didn't splurge was on things that didn't matter. Right. Like, uh, people spend all kinds of, like the chairs, right? I got solid, solid chairs that were hydraulic. The electric chairs have issues. The Serona chairs, I worked in an office where the hygienist, they weren't even two years old. She smacked the LCD. The girl shit her pants because the screen was four grand. Right? I got my chair for less than that. You know, the chair has to go up, down, left, right. You don't need LCD. It's just one more thing to go wrong. So what, what else did you buy? I found the Endotech. It's Endo hyphen tech is that called a hyphen or yeah endo horizontal hyphen tech.com you splurge on that uh, what kind of chairs did yeah. you buy i got a forest forest now that's a name yeah. i haven't heard for a while that, that's a good uh medium cost chair yeah they're all hydraulic up down left from made in the u.s like solid chairs yeah um, um did you buy a laser no. Did you buy a chair? No. I, uh, no. Uh, did you buy digital radiography? Yeah, digital or X-rays. 
And what, what did you go with there? Uh, I think they're like quick rate, and then the pan's like a refurbished pan. So, so you bought it? Yeah, I didn't want it. Like, I you had a used pan. Yeah. So, uh, so um, what else? Uh, most of it's pretty basic, honestly. Like we we custom made, custom made the uh, equipment, custom made the oh Indutech. The I know that's in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. So that's on the other side of Canada from you. Your West Coast, yeah. Canada, and their East Coast, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Yeah. Some of the best yeah. fishing in the world's up there. Are you a fisherman? Yes, sir. Yeah. Are you a fisherman? No. Oh my God, I love no. fishing. Yeah. I don't have the patience. You don't have the patience? Yeah, me and my uh, one of my best friends from dental school, Craig Steigen, we used to go to Cabo like every year. And, uh, God, that was yeah. so fun, just sailing out there. And uh, you could just catch anything at the tip of Cabo. It's one of those, one of those areas where all these migratory patterns are crowded. You never know what you're going to pull up. And, yeah. and uh, But I was uh, fishing up one time by uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Do you remember when I took you and the boys there? Yeah. And uh, I told the guy... He goes, uh, I go, so what, what's legal? And he goes, he goes, uh, well, you're not allowed to uh, catch great white sharks up here. Man, we caught a bunch of sharks and uh, cold water sharks. <laughs> he says, so what you do is before you cast in, he says, you got to tell the bait, no great whites allowed. And the guy was laughing. He goes, isn't that a stupid law? He says, you can't catch a great white. He goes, how the hell do you know what's going to bite this hook? You have no control over what's going to yeah. bite this hook. But, uh, but that was, that was yeah. when I learned uh, sharks were not very smart. Because my boy pulled in like an 11 foot giant. Do you remember? No, 11. That was when we were in warm water. That was South Florida. So it was like a blue shark or something. But it, it, I forgot what it was. But anyway, it had this very distinguished scratch on the top of his head. And so, of course, we catch and release. And two hours later, another boy, another one of my boys, caught the same damn shark. <laughs> and when we were pulling up, everybody, everybody agreed to say that. I go, that's the same one. I mean, so uh, that's yeah. when I learned that sharks cannot be that smart. There are people like that. They're dentists like that. Make the same mistake again oh, and yeah. again. You're right. Again. Point well taken. Point well taken. I think the funniest yeah. one dentists makes is when they start dating their ex. It's like, really, dude? <laughs> really? I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure you divorced that woman, and now, now you're dating her again? How, how, how could that be a good idea? So you're right. So I, I should uh, leave sharks alone. Uh, yeah. But, oh, but you know. The only way you can be good at dentistry is like getting back up on your feet. So sometimes that translates in the wrong way. Like you perf a root canal. You don't give up on root canals. You go back in there. So in a way you can say maybe he's like, hey, I'm here for a second go. Which might work yeah. the second time. So what's the best Never advice uh, Gigi ever gave you? Uh, you, you and I, you and I should say. start a mutual Gigi fan club. Well, what's, yeah, the, what's should, the best eh? advice she ever gave you? Oh, she's given me tons, but but she, uh, I think I would say is like don't don't spend money on stupid shit. <laughs> she'd say, you know, like all the fancy stuff. She's like, and how many employees you know, does she have? I think she was her, and then the odd assistant or two. You know, she basically has zero employees. Yeah. And I and I yeah. I think um I think what what dentists are not realizing, but I, I I think one of the best ways to get an education is to get out of your own tribe, get to another country. And I think one of the biggest laws of unintended consequences that ever affected me is lecturing around the world, and you see so black and white clear in so many cases in Tokyo and Singapore where dentists followed Gigi, where they said, well, all these offices that were trying to have <laughs> six, eight operatories and all this staff, and you're talking about an office manager. And they went the other way and said, I'm going to have one square, one chair, no employees. You want to call me? Here's my iPhone. And they, instead of doing 745000 and taking home 145, they do like 200000 and take home like one eighty. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, I, 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 I knew a dentist in a small town in Missouri and he won't let me podcast him because he's all humble and all this stuff. But he's basically in a small town in Missouri by himself. And he does 300 
out of one chair and he takes home 275 and it just and you see yeah. and you see that a lot in asia and um so in america it's it's a lot and the sweet spot of bankruptcy for a dental office is right around the two million dollar mark between one and a half and three million so they got this one office so you know they're going wall street so they, they go open up a satellite office and the confusion there is insanity and by the time they get the third office open they go completely bankrupt and um and yeah. a lot of people make a lot of noise and that noise is so expensive, and then uh, then there's people like Gigi who should be the uh, Saint Apollonia of overhead, and uh, you know who Saint Apollonia is? Yeah. The the uh, if you're Catholic, that's the patron saint of dentistry, um, and she she's just uh, the the patron saint of no overhead. She has no labor, and she's just a nothing she's man. A she, she's hardworking and no labor. But, but I, I think part of it goes to, you know, it's like if you don't have a busy office, you don't look like it's better to look like you're busy and making money than actually making money. Because what Gigi does and what those guys, it's not glamorous. Like, you don't go and be like, it's nice to say, man, I have 20 staff and we have 19 because it, everything turns into like a penis measuring contest for whatever reason. No offense to women. It's like, you know, women are better at this, but I mean, men are like, I have 12 ops and I have four associates and look at all these, you know, it's like serfdom. And it's like, bro, you're in healthcare. You know, this is not serfdom. These aren't like, this is, these are really people like, you know, that it becomes less of like what's what the numbers matter more about what it sounds like because it sounds way cooler to have eight ops, right? If I told you I have three ops, you're not going to be impressed. If I tell you six, you're like, wow, right? I could tell you I'm bankrupt. That's later, but that three ops could be doing like you said, double the profit. It's not sexy. Well, the, I mean, that's how Napoleon took over half of Europe as he realized that all his other competitors, all the other countries, they all had paid mercenaries. And he spent his entire career designing all these elaborate awards and ribbons and titles and trophies. And his men were diving for the ball. And when the mercenaries saw, you know, when they would come to another country, they'd see Napoleon's army with all these gowns and slashes and ribbons and all these men just all psyched out of their mind. Most of them just dropped their arms and ran. I mean, they're like, if, if, you, if you're willing to die <laughs> that much, you know, you can, you can die. I, I'm out of here. Uh, associates, right? They're, you, you know, they're basically, in a way, like healthcare mercenaries, right? Unless they have buy-in, unless they have something into it, why would you expect them not to? Why would I pay a guy 60%, 65%, 70%, and then do extra work on top of that, right? So it's a way, if you don't value add, if you don't add them into the system, don't make them a part of your clinic, of course they're going to walk out. You can't, you can't bitch about associates. It, it goes both ways, right? So tell me um, about your dental mission trip to an orphanage in Peru, and why did that change your life? And then why did you go back to the Amazon where you almost got killed by a uh, tarantula and an <laughs> um, a- anaconda? <laughs> yeah. Well, would, the anaconda is someone killed, but uh, I'll go back to Peru. The, the anaconda- first thing I wanted to do was... The anaconda, like a lady killed with a machete in the morning. Oh, yeah. So that was a sight to see. Yeah. Um, when I, it's a funny story. Like, so my sister used to volunteer. My sister's a dentist, by the way. And she's used to volunteer in Calgary. Yeah, eight years. She's in uh, Long Island. And when, but she was in Calgary for a bit. She used to volunteer downtown. And there's a place where, you know, poor people come for extractions. So I went there and I would shadow her in high school. And uh, the guy who wrote my, who started that program wrote my reference letter to get into dental school. And I promised him that, you know, someday when I graduate, when I can do extractions, I can come back and, and actually help out. So the first thing I did when I graduated was we went in an ocean on that mission trip with a pediatric dentist. And when you see a thousand, I don't know if you've ever seen a thousand orphans, but when you see an entire orphanage of a thousand children with no parents, that, that's something to take in. You've got, and then because of birth control being an issue, they'll literally, you know, drop the babies off at the doorstep. So you have all these kids who've never seen their parents, right? You talk about gratitude. You talk You're about, about like, in you know, Peru because they're Catholic and don't believe in birth control. 
Well, no, I'm just saying that was the environment. It's like, you know, younger parents couldn't afford to have kids and they wouldn't abort the baby, so they would just drop them off at but the that, orphanage. But that was in Peru, though, right? Yeah, that was in Lima, yeah. Yeah, in Lima, and, Peru. And what, um, what percent is that Catholic? Well, I'm not, I don't know about the details. I just know that that's how we had a thousand kids without orphanage. Yeah, they're, they're, they're all that Catholic. Was, and, and, I mean, we're going, yeah. through that, we're going through that today in the United States where, on the one hand, they want to unfund Planned Parenthood because they don't believe in that and birth control and all that stuff. And then the flip side of that is you go see an orphanage with a thousand kids who have never seen their parents. And I don't want to get into politics, yeah. sex, and yeah, all that stuff. Politics, but, but anyways, but, yeah. but these were the best kids you've ever seen. That's the thing, Howard, is like they were polite. They were... You know, they were just amazing, and but that that gets to you, you know, so, and then you talk about opportunity and being grateful and that. I mean, like, a lot of these, like, right off the bat, they don't have, you know, they've got a harder road to climb, so just, and it was giving back with dentistry, right? It's very easy to bitch and complain. We all, like, oh, patient was this and that, Aaron Grumpy and that, but like you, like you said, you travel and you work on good people. It changes your mind, both on dentistry and on people. Because it's pure dentistry. There's no insurance. There's no worrying about this or that. It's just pure in itself. And then you realize that dentistry in its pure sense is different from what it is that's taught in schools. So that's pure dentistry. You're there just for, you don't have to worry about bailing. You just go there, take care of the person, help them, and leave. That's pure in sense. And that's what mission trips are. I have to say one thing, um, and I know people hate uh, econ where, where economics, you know, this isn't a religious statement. I just want to say this. I, I grew up Catholic. I went to Mass every single day from age birth to 17, all through grammar school, high school. I went to Creighton Catholic College. But all the Catholic countries are poverty. And um, Peru is 85% is Catholic, 11% Protestant, the remaining 4% are Adventists, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Israelites of the New Universal Pact. But the bottom line is, I just want you to think about this. So let's say you have a pizza, and that pizza is growing 3% a year, but your population is growing 6% a year. That means every year your slice of the pizza gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So if your population grows faster, then your economy grows. You're growing poverty, which explains Mexico all the way to Argentina, all of Central and South America. The problem is their economy does not grow faster than their population rate. And what, where did we grow the fastest uh, wealth in the last, since World War II? It was in China. And when you look at China's miracle, everybody talks about all these things, but what they don't talk about is it was the one child rule. They knew that if they stopped their population growth at one, because you need 2.3 kids per family just to maintain the herd. So when they actually went to one child per family, they had a shrinking herd. So any type of growth of the economy, I mean, it could have just been two, three, four percent was massive and they, and they grew the most wealth in the world. Then you go next door to China, India, which has about the same population and nobody would call India an economic miracle because when you go there, I mean, half the population is under 21 years old and you all these kids running the street, and that what because of um, religion and politics, the planet doesn't want to sit back and think about, we have to control the rate of growth of this herd. And then I also would think what's the hilarious thing about some of my biggest environmental freak friends who want to drive electrical cars and recycle their trash and all this stuff are my neighbors with eight children. It's like, do you know the carbon impact of having a child? And if you, if you want to save uh, the planet, the first thing you should do is not have your current population of 7.5 billion homo sapiens turn into 15 billion homo sapiens on 2050. I mean, every year, Earth has more babies than the entire state of California. And this herd can't drop. 40 million new frogs a year and, and then try to save the planet by recycling uh, your trash. And I know that we got uh, we uh, digressed and went off tangent, but yeah, I love missionary dentistry because the first time I did but it... those I, kids... Yeah. Go that's ahead. the thing, Hardy, you're talking about all the... But those kids didn't do anything. None of it was their fault. Oh, I know. And that's I why... I, 
but but that's why I meant a lot because you're actually helping somebody who has who's done nothing wrong. You know, all of the politics and it's done nothing to do with the poor kid, it's just a poor kid with an abscess, and that's why it's pure. And then when I went there, it wasn't about. It was just there's a kid. I'll help him. You know, we made a difference. And and then so every time you're in your office and you're pissed off, it's been a long day and insurance and I don't in the U.S. you have Delta has denied your claim. And then you think back to that moment, and you realize, man, it's not it's not dentistry. You're blaming dentistry. It's not dentistry. It's insurance. It's the political, it's the environment. It's not dentistry. So in its pure sense, don't blame the dentistry. Yeah, and it's a uh, it was the the. Most fun about growing up Catholic was that uh, about every quarter they'd send you to a retreat. So you had to unhook. You know, after Friday, you get in a bus, you go to the seminary, and you, you couldn't do your routine. So it just forced you to think. And, you know, you'd hear all these lectures, but a lot of it was just unhooking and unplugging and thinking. And in fact, uh, I, I thought that was an amazing thing. And I I remember the first time I did a charity ministry thing in Mexico, um, the a hundred patients stood out there all night in a tropical rain holding their babies in the rain because they really wanted uh, these Americans to check their baby's tooth because, you know, she had a toothache. And I, we, we were sitting out there drinking beers on the porch looking at these women, just stoic women holding their babies. And I thought, man, that is the meaning of life. I mean, can you imagine standing out there holding a baby in the rain all night long just for a chance that one of us lazy butt Americans is going to fix your child's suit tomorrow. But you know the weirdest um, uh, orphanage I ever saw in my life? Tanzania. Right. And guess what the orphanage was for? You know the, um, the kids that have, you know, what's that um, skin pigmentation that Michael, Jordan, Michael Jackson had? Vitiligo? Oh. Vitiligo. Yeah. Are you familiar with vitiligo? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. So it's kind of like a depigmentation of the skin. Yeah. Okay. In uh, in Central Africa, when the medicine the, those are worth like a black rhino, the medicine man um, want those and pay dearly for them because they use pieces of their body in their um, in their their witchcraft and their lotions and potions. And so relief workers, whenever they see a young kid with that, they know he's going to get kidnapped and killed and cut up into pieces. So they drop him in this orphanage. And I went to an orphanage. And it was, it was hundreds of these little kids with all this depigmentation deal, and and they're all in there with these ten foot walls with razor wire all the way around it, because it was like worth catching an elephant or a rhino if you could get one of these kids, and they had to keep them in there until they were the size of uh, you and me and could fight some sixty seventy year old witch doctor. Is that just crazy? That shit crazy? Yeah. Like but, uh, even the Amazon, we went. Yeah, tell us. We about went boat to boat. Trip. Yeah, so we went to Iquitos and then uh, we stayed in the middle of the uh, eco lodge. And every day we loaded up our equipment and went village to village, literally, in a boat, unloaded in the heat, got there, set up our, our things, and then just started seeing village. And we had a group of medical doctors with us too. And I remember the funniest thing I did was I, I, um, I jacked the medical boat because I just wanted, I don't know, before I die, I just wanted to drive a boat in the Amazon. I don't know why. Seemed like a good idea, so <laughs> like I'm taking this boat. So honestly, driving down the Amazon with this boat, double rainbows, that was something I'll I'll remember for for life. But what I mean is, these mission trips can be fun, and and going village to village, seeing these people, and man, like they're they're so patient. They don't even know what it needs to take. Like when you give them something, you know, give toys from there. You know, depending where you go in the world, like you'll get sworn, but here, not a person came. And if they did, they would take and give to someone because it's not even in their culture. It's to give, not to take. And I, that kind of struck a chord. And just, yeah, patient. And they've never seen anything. You know, there were remote villages, middle of nowhere. They, so that really changes your, your, your perspective on things. And the funniest thing, though, I was doing an extraction and we had an OBGYN. He was part of the medical group. He said, I'll come, you know, a little bravado. He's like, I'm going to come help you suction. I'm there, I mean, I'm, I'm doing, doing ghetto dentistry in the middle of the Amazon, pulling his tooth out, and the guy is looking at me, and he gets all faint, and he passed out. The OBGYN passed out. When he gets back, I asked his wife, I'm like, what's wrong with him? I'm like, I mean, come on, OBGYNs, they see some gruesome stuff. He's like, yeah, but it's different in the mouth. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> 
that was I that was interesting. That maybe that's a disconnect history, you know. I don't know, but but it was it was a different experience for sure. Yeah, I um, you know, we got fifty categories on Dental Town, and um, one when I'm out there lecturing on the road, the one that, I mean, you think that the ones with the most views are implies like endo implants, practice management. But when I'm out there on the road. The ones that talk about dental town almost get verklempt because we have a category called humanitarian dentistry. And so many times, uh, dentists will say to me, you know what, I was burned out, I was fried, I didn't know the meaning of life, whatever. And I was reading this thread under um, humanitarian dentistry, under missionary dentistry or charitable dentistry. So I took a trip and I did a missionary dentist trip to like Haiti or Mexico or Africa or whatever, Vietnam. Cambodia, and they said it totally changed their life, just completely changed life. And one of my biggest mentor practice management consultants, consultants right up the street here, is uh, Greg Stanley, and he um, he's very big into these missionary trips to Haiti for that exact reason. He'd be listening to these doctors, and he'd think, "Okay, am I a practice management consultant or am I a psychiatrist? I mean, are you talking to me over the phone, or are you laying on a couch, and I need to help you?" And he thought the best thing these guys need first is I'm going to take your butt to Haiti so you can get your head on straight. And then when we start coming back here and start talking about your practice, you're not going to have all these irrational expectations and beliefs and self-limiting beliefs and a pity party and all that stuff. And he was just really big on, okay, this guy's lost touch with reality. Let's do So missionary dentistry is huge. And I think that's so telling of you that you're only five years out of school and you've already done two trips to Peru and Amazon and you already claim uh, that it changed your life and set the tone for the rest of your career. I love you to death, Manu. I really do. I think, uh, I think you're all that and a bag of chips. And uh, I, uh, I love reading your posts. I, so many times I read your posts on Dental Town. Uh, you, you make me smile from ear to ear. But uh, I can't believe we already went an hour. We went over an hour and 20 but uh, seriously, dude, thanks for sharing your journey on Dental Town since 2012. Thanks for sharing 5,500 posts of uh, what so many people believe but keep in the closet. Uh, you know, I always look on Dental Town and, you know, so many people will send me an email or something, this long, drawn out thing. I said, well, dude, post it on Dental Town so that everybody can share. Nah, I'm too embarrassed. I don't want to do that. I don't want everybody to say, I just want, you know, I just want to talk to you. And it's guys like you who share these these thoughts from A to Z uh, that really make Dental Town yeah. what it is. I appreciate that. Well, you, you make Dental Town what it is. No, I didn't make Dental Town. I mean, I'm, I'm no different than uh, just uh, the AT&T phone company. I mean, I just provided uh, a cord from you to Gigi, but it, it's you and Gigi talking on Dental Town. Are you and Ryan McCall talking on Dental That's what Dental Town is. I, I, I didn't do a damn thing, um, you know, but... Um, and I got nothing to sell. I got no book. I just wanted to be like, this is real dentistry. I just wanted to give a shout out to the guys because there are a lot of guys like me and Gigi and, you know, doing hard work, not glorified stuff, but making, you know, helping people out. And I think, I think we should applaud that for the new grads. That's where, that's where it's at. All right. Well, uh, good at you, mate. And I can't wait to see you again sometime. Maybe I'll see you at the next townie meeting after 15 yeah, I mean, years in or, or in, in Vegas. Now that I'm a selfish bastard yeah, okay. and have grandchildren, and I already signed up the next two in Orlando because uh, my uh, my grandkids want to go. <laughs> so I'll see you around, buddy. Yeah, okay.